if you would grab your Bibles as you grab your seat and open with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, this morning we're going to look at verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> Mark 2. Are you the kind of person who likes new things, new technology? You like to change it up and to mix it up? Or are you the kind of person who doesn't like change? You want to keep it the way it is. It's better the way it is. Let's not change it. I know for, I mean, it depends on the subject, right? For my wife, Meg, she doesn't like new technology. She's wary of it. She had to be convinced to change from cassettes to CDs and then from CDs to an MP3 player. And even then, she was playing her MP3 player through the tape deck in her Jeep, like that little adapter thing. So that was, I mean, it was a big deal to get her to switch from a cell phone with buttons to a cell phone with a touch screen. She's like, I just, I don't like it. It, does, it doesn't, and to be fair, she, for some reason, touch screens don't usually work for her. I don't know what that's all about, but... So she, when it comes to technology, she's like, let's not change, let's let it roll, let's keep it going. I know that for people in general, they are wary of change. This is why when a company uh, updates the design of the box on their product, you know, it's like Cheerios, it's got a new logo or something, they got to put that big stamp on there that says like, new look, same great taste or whatever. They're just trying to encourage you like, don't worry, it's not that different, it's not that big of a change. Well, today we are going to learn in our text about a pretty major change. We're going to read that Jesus and his coming and his ministry and his death, burial and resurrection, that he fulfilled the old covenant. And we're going to unpack what that means. If that's that strange terminology, if that's unfamiliar to you, we're going to understand what that means. But he's going to fulfill basically this contract that God made between him and his people in the Old Testament, and he's going to establish a new covenant. We heard the prophecy about this given through the prophet Jeremiah that we read earlier in the service, that a time would come when rather than having the laws written on these tablets of stone, they would be written on the hearts of people. This would be the new covenant. And so this is going to be difficult. We're going to see the people of God wrestle with this all throughout the book of Mark because this is not a small change. This is not a new logo on the Cheerios box. This is the end of a code of life that defined God's people for thousands of years. And so it's going to, we're going to see them wrestle with it. But I think it's important that we wrestle with it as well. If nothing else, just to understand God's purpose in the Old Covenant. I mean, why was there an Old Covenant anyway? Why did he establish a New Covenant? Why couldn't we have just done the New Covenant from the beginning? Uh, what changed between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? This is an enormous topic that we won't have time to fully exhaust this morning. And really, to even to begin to cover it, we're going to have to look at several different texts throughout God's Word. Because God's Word is a, a perfectly woven tapestry. It all fo- comes together to form the same picture, the same narrative, cohesive and beautiful. But in order to understand how it all fits together, sometimes we have to zoom in and, and look at one very small particular passage. Sometimes we have to zoom out and see how the passages are interrelated. This is kind of what we did when we studied about God's presence, the word Emmanuel, from Genesis to Revelation, and we we talked about it for six weeks. Well, this morning, we're going to have to kind of do a similar thing in one sermon. So buckle up. I'm going to talk fast. There's a lot of content. But let me encourage you, if you're not in a small group, I would really suggest you get plugged into one just for lots of different reasons, for accountability and for fellowship. But also, whenever we come across a a really enormous topic in our text, you get a second go at it to, to talk it out. A lot of times to understand something, you need to process it out loud. And so in our small group curriculum, you can have the opportunity to wrestle again with some of these concepts and these topics. And so I would encourage you to get plugged into a small group if you're not already in one. But if you want to keep your spot in Mark chapter 2, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. But you might find Galatians chapter 3 as well, because Paul there specifically answers the question, why did we need the law at all? And that's going to be incredibly helpful for us this morning as we study what Jesus taught the people. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's a household name. He's known all across Israel. People are traveling far and wide to hear his teachings and to see the miraculous things that he's doing. 
And Jesus is very carefully, very purposefully revealing all of who he is to God's people in the perfect time and in the perfect way. He's showing himself to be the Christ, the Messiah, but more than that, to be God in the flesh. And so what we find as we look at verse 18 is that the people of God had some questions about who Jesus is especially in comparison to other religious leaders of his day. Hey, Jesus, how are you similar to these people? How are you different? And that is the perfect transition for Jesus to show the people and to show us in what ways he is similar or continues the concepts of the old covenant and in what ways he presents or changes and gives us new concepts and new ideas. And so we're going to look at this idea of fasting. That's what the question is about that the people of God have for him. But he's going to use the concept of fasting to then transition to a much bigger topic of uh, helping us to understand what is the same and what is different between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So look at verse 18 and we'll see the question that he was asked. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So this is a very logical question for the people to ask. They look around at these different religious leaders, and they see some similarities. All three of these groups, both Jesus' disciples, John's disciples, and Pharisees' disciples, would all take the holiness of God very seriously. There is a certain way that we are supposed to live in response to who God is at his core. And so they see some of these similarities, but then they key on this difference. And they want to know, Jesus, what's the deal? Why don't you fast? Well, in order for Jesus to answer that question, first we need to know, well, why did John's disciples fast? And why did the disciples of the Pharisees fast? And we'll have to look to the Old Testament to answer that question. Before we do that, let me give one caveat, and that's that we see throughout the New Testament that oftentimes the Pharisees missed the big picture of God's Word, and they got it twisted up and did things for entirely the wrong reason. And we're going to talk about that next week when we look at the topic, the subject of Sabbath. But for this week, rather than focusing on what Jesus corrected, we're going to focus on what Jesus changed, okay? There are many things that the Pharisees need corrected on, but let's assume that at least some of the Pharisees were fasting for the right reasons according to the Old Testament. So why did John's disciples fast? Why did the disciples of the Pharisees fast? Well, in Leviticus 16 verse 29, this is the only commandment in all of the Old Testament where the people are required to fast, And this is only takes place once a year on the Day of Atonement. And so the Day of Atonement was the day once a year when the high priest would make a sacrifice. He would take the blood of the animal. He would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood on the altar and on the ark. And the death of that animal was supposed to represent the taking of the punishment for sin for the people of God. And the the blood was supposed to be the payment for the punishment for sin for the people of God. And so on this day, when the people are focusing all of their hearts and all of their attention on the seriousness of their sin and the graciousness of God, they were required to fast. And so the word that is used in Leviticus is actually very helpful for us to understand what they were doing through this fast. It is translated at least in the ESV, as affliction. You are to afflict yourselves in this way through fasting. But it could be translated just as easily as humble. You are to humble yourselves. And so what we see in this practice of fasting was that this was supposed to be a picture of just how serious their sin is and how they recognized the seriousness of their sin. That it would almost be like, have you ever been so upset about anything that you've lost your appetite? You're so upset about a loss in your family or the loss of a relationship or whatever it is. that you just, You're not hungry and you naturally fast. Well, that's what the people of God were doing. Is they were trying to demonstrate 
and to grow in themselves a soul sickness over their sin. God, we see how serious our sin is. We see how much we need your grace and mercy. And they demonstrated that through fasting. And so if we wanted to kind of summarize what the people of God were doing with the Old Testament practice of fasting, we could say it in this way, that God's people fasted in preparation of Christ's coming. God's people fasted in preparation of Christ's coming. So, so why would soul sickness over sin be a step of preparation for Christ's coming? Well, first let's understand what we're talking about when we say Christ's coming. We hear the word Christ and we immediately associate it with the name of Jesus. We know who the Christ, who the Messiah was. But the people of God, they knew about the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, which just means the rescuer, the hero that God is going to send. And they had many prophecies about this person, but they didn't know exactly who he was. But they knew that he was coming to save them and to rescue them from their sin. Which meant in order to be prepared for him to come, they needed to continuously take their sin seriously. But that was the entire purpose of John the Baptist's ministry. was a, a, a ministry of preparation. The Christ, the Messiah, God's hero is coming, therefore repent. Realize the seriousness of your sin and be ready for him to come and to save you. That we see a similar picture in Jonah. We studied through the book of Jonah not that long ago. And when Jonah brought the message of judgment because of the Ninevites' sin, what did they do? They fasted. They covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes, and they fasted. And what were they saying through that action? They were saying to God, we see that our sin is so serious that we need your mercy and your grace more than we need anything else. Even more than food, the thing that is most basic for life. We need your grace and your mercy even more than that. And that's what the people of God were doing in the Old Testament when they participated in fasting. Now, the Pharisees, they stepped up the game. Instead of fasting once a year, they were known for fasting twice a week. And so, of course, it would be natural for the people of God to look and go, ah, what's going on here, Jesus? We know we're supposed to fast at least once a year. And we see these guys who take their sin very seriously, they fast twice a week. So what's the deal? Why aren't you fasting more often? Why don't you take sin more seriously? And it was the answer is that Jesus was helping them to see the difference between preparation and and realization. Okay? So, let's look at at Galatians chapter 3 to understand this more fully. So, luckily for us, there are a couple different places we could look at in the New Testament, but here in Galatians 3 is maybe the, the most extended section where the Apostle Paul answers this question for us clearly. Why then the law? If Jesus was going to come and free us from the law, why was the law necessary in the first place at all? He answers that question. Verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. So transgressions meaning sins, our failure to live up to God's perfect standard, our our natural human disregard of holiness, So what Paul says was, because we by nature do not seek out holy things, because we by nature hunger for sin rather than for righteousness, God gave us the law as a way of pointing the people of God back toward God's holiness. Because we were waiting until a certain time. Look at verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. All right, this is a little vague unless you're familiar with the Bible. But who is this offspring? What promise are we talking about? Well, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, to the very beginning, the very first sin, and the very first curse from sin. Man and woman, we fell into sin uh, by our own desire, our own choices. 
But then God promised that he would send a rescuer through the offspring of the people. He promised to Eve, one will come from you who will crush the head of the serpent. Meaning there would be a descendant who would come and defeat Satan. And then we go forward in history and we have Abraham. And God promised to Abraham that from him he would make him a multitude, but there would be one who would be the blessing to many nations. And so this is who Paul is talking about. The one, the rescuer, the Messiah, the Christ, that the people of God have been waiting for now for thousands of years. And so Paul tells us that the law was given for that period of time while the people of God waited on the Messiah, the Christ. Well, what function did it serve? We know it was because of our sin, because of transgression, but what function did it serve? Look now at verse three, uh, 23 of Galatians. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So this word guardian is super helpful for us to get a picture of what the law accomplished, why God gave it in the first place. This word guardian referred to a specific role in an ancient household. Okay, especially we're thinking of a kind of a wealthier household. The, the father has this son, this heir, and he wants to raise him up right so he can be a good leader. So what's he going to do? He's going to send him off to school. But guess what? In the ancient world, kids weren't that different as they are from today. Um, they, they, he would often send him to school in the morning, and guess what the son's going to do? Not go to school. And so they would appoint a guardian, one of their slaves. His job would be to make sure the son got to school, stayed at school, did his schoolwork, and got back home. That was the role that Paul was referring to here when he says the word guardian. And so this guardian, his role, in a sense, was to keep the son captive, until the appropriate time when he came of age. Now, I actually would disagree with how the translators of the ESV choose the word held captive and imprisoned there in verse 23, because those words are inherently negative, but they could be translated in a more positive way, meaning that we were protected, held in protective custody until the time came. That even though maybe the kid doesn't like it, it's for his good. It's for uh, his protection. That the picture is this. In the same way that the kid would wander off from his teaching without the guardian, the people of God would wander off from the holiness of God unless they had the law pointing them back to God's holiness. That that's what the law accomplished. But it was never intended to continue forever. It was a guardian until a certain time. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman. There he is. The one who will crush the head of the serpent. Born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And so for that time, the law served that very important purpose, restraining the people of God from the fullness of sin, maintaining a, a holy remnant, and teaching them, most importantly, of their need for salvation. Elsewhere in the Bible, we are told that the law makes us more aware of just how sinful we are. That we see just how badly we need God to send the Messiah, the Christ. And so, this is what the practice of fasting represents. In fact, this is what all of the practices of the Old Testament represent. A maintaining of the holiness of God and a preparation of God's people while they wait for the Christ to come. And so, what we see, as we kind of understand God's big picture here, his plan of salvation, is that when Jesus came to fulfill the old 
covenant and to establish the new covenant. This was not him saying that the old covenant was wrong or that it was a bad idea. Let's go with plan B. No, it was him saying that the old covenant was incomplete. It wasn't God's full plan of redemption. Instead, it was a step a part of the plan, and the next step, the next part of the plan, was for the Christ to come to fulfill the old covenant and to establish the new covenant. And, and so the thing that we can trust from that passage we just read, Galatians 4.4, 4, is that the Christ came when? In the fullness of time. At the perfect time. And so we go, well, why didn't God just send Jesus in the beginning And we don't have to understand why, but we see why. It wasn't the right time. God, in his perfect wisdom, his sovereign knowledge, he knew exactly when the Christ could come. And he sent him, not a day sooner and not a day later. And until it was the fullness of time, we were held in guardianship under the law. But that law was As an important step of preparation, it was important, but it was not the end goal. Instead, it was like being engaged. That's kind of the picture that Jesus is going to pick up on as we look at verse 19. When you are engaged, that is supposed to be a time of preparation. That we are working towards being married. This is going to help us to be ready and to to be uh, successful as a married couple. But and I hope I'm not putting anybody on blast here, you're not supposed to be engaged forever. It's a time of preparation. And that is exactly what Jesus answers to the people when they say, hey, why don't you fast? Well, fasting was what purpose? It was a purpose of preparation. So look at verse 19. So why don't you fast, Jesus? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So Jesus asks them a question. Is it okay for you to fast when you're at a wedding? And there was actually a custom about this. Because the Pharisees were so bad about being holier than thou, that a lot of times they would show up to a wedding and they would fast and they would just be party poopers. Oh, you know, I can't can't participate because I'm fasting. And so they actually created a custom that you are not allowed to fast at a wedding because you're ruining the party for everybody else. (laughs) And so the answer was, no, you're not allowed to fast at a wedding. Well, why? Because you're with the the bride and with the groom. This is a day of celebration, not a day of mourning, not a day of sadness or brokenness over sin. This is a day to rejoice and to celebrate. And so in this picture, Jesus describes himself as the bridegroom, as the groom. And this might seem subtle to us, but I don't think it was subtle to the original audience. He, in in this statement, is equating himself to God. He is saying, I am God in the flesh. What did we read from Jeremiah 31? God described himself as the husband of his people. And Jesus is saying, this law that has been preparing you for the groom has been good. And that's why you've been fasting in preparation. But the time of preparation is over. It's not time to prepare. It's time to celebrate. We are celebrating the wedding now. And so God's people fasted first in preparation of Christ's coming. But then when Christ's coming came, we we see this, that God's people celebrated the inauguration of Christ's kingdom. We're not preparing anymore. This is the inauguration. That's a big word. It just means the start or the beginning. I could have put start or beginning, but then it wouldn't have rhymed. And I wanted it to rhyme. So God's people celebrated the inauguration of Christ's kingdom. Time of preparation was over. It's time to celebrate. And we, we've all had similar experiences to this, even if you haven't been married. But you have the, uh, this time of building and preparation and excitement. And then the time comes and you celebrate. So maybe that's for kids. Maybe that's Christmas morning. You're preparing. You're excited. You can't wait. It's coming. It's coming. And then Christmas comes. 
Or maybe it's uh, for older kids, you're working towards graduation. And those last few months leading up to graduation, they feel forever long. Can't we just get there? It's preparation and excitement. And then graduation comes and you celebrate. Or, or we've already seen, it's the same thing with an engagement. You're preparing, you're excited, you can't wait, but then the marriage comes, you celebrate. Or the same with a birth. You're preparing, you're excited, and then you celebrate when the birth of a child happens. All of these are pictures of waiting and then celebration. And Jesus says, that is why I'm not fasting. That's why my disciples are not fasting. We are celebrating. This is the start of God reclaiming this world. This is the beginning of me crushing the head of the serpent. This is the the beginning of rescue for all people. This is me releasing you from your guardian. This is not a time to fast. This is a time to celebrate. We've been waiting. We've been preparing. And now the time has finally come. So this is a good thing. But it is different. The preparation is over. Now it's time to celebrate. So that being said, Jesus helped the people to understand why in that day, at that moment, the people of God, his disciples, were not fasting. But then he explains how it will be as we keep reading. Verse 20. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So this is a twist in the story. This is not what the people were expecting. And when we hear this, we kind of picture uh, modern American weddings where you go and you party for a couple hours, and then the bride and the groom, they go away. They go off to their honeymoon, right? The, the, the rice, or I don't know, not rice anymore because people are scared of killing birds, but whatever. They go off, right? And that's not what they did in the ancient days, or at least in Israel. Instead, the wedding was a seven-day feast, At the new couple's house, the guests came to the house, they partied for seven days celebrating, and then the guests leave, and the couple stays to begin their new life together. So the the idea of the groom being taken away was a twist to them. This is not the normal practice. Something has gone wrong in their minds. This was not the plan that they expected. And so they would have been confused by Jesus saying this. Why would the groom be taken away? And we, on the other side of the cross, on the other side of uh, Jesus' life and ministry, we know what he's referring to. He's referring to himself. That he would willingly die on the cross. And in doing so, he would give the blood necessary to seal the new covenant. And then... Even though he was resurrected three days after his death by the power of God, he would then ascend to heaven. And from the throne room of heaven, he would act as our mediator, our intercessor of the new covenant. And so there was this moment of celebration because the marriage is happening, but then there's this moment of interruption that maybe we didn't expect. It wasn't a surprise to God, but it's a surprise to us. The marriage ceremony has not fully been completed. And we wait for our bridegroom, for our groom to return. The church being the bride, Jesus being the groom. In Revelation, when we hear about Christ returning, how is it described? The end of the book. It's described as the wedding feast of the Lamb. Meaning we recognize that our wedding feast got interrupted And when Jesus returns, that is when we will complete the feast. That is when we will consummate the marriage between the church and Christ. That's when we will be fully together and we will start our new life together in eternity, in paradise, in our new home together. And so, this completely changes the reason why God's people fast today. And here you were hoping that fasting was one of the things that we got rid of, right? I mean, thankfully, we get to eat bacon. Praise the Lord, right? But we see that fasting is still a part of what it means to be God's people today, but for a very different reason. It's not in preparation of Christ's coming. Instead, it's for this. God's people fast 
because of separation from Christ's presence. God's people fast. Notice previously we've been talking about past tense. They fasted, they celebrated, and now we talk about present tense. We continue today to fast. Why? Because of our separation from Christ's presence. It's again that picture of being so upset about something that you lose your appetite. But it's a different kind of soul sickness. This is not a concern over our sin. No, Christ, he paid the punishment for our sin. Instead, this is a love sickness. We are far from our groom. And we long to be fully in his presence. And so because of that longing, we lose our appetite. And that is why we fast. To show that we want desperately to be fully in the presence of Jesus. Maybe you've had that experience when you're young and in love and you're far from the one you love. Meg and I, when we dated, she was in New Orleans and I was up in Kentucky. We were like 12 and a half hours away while we uh, dated and engaged. And uh, those last few months, they just feel so long and so slow because you want to be with the one you love. Or a few years ago, when we were in the process of adopting Layla in Kingston, and I, got, I was called to a church in Kentucky, there was some miscommunication, it's a long story, but I basically had to move ahead to Kentucky for a couple months. And I went back and forth as often as I could. But during that time, I was away from the ones I loved, and it was a hard time of soul sickness, because I loved them and I wanted to be in their presence. And this is a picture of why we would fast today. Yes, we have Christ's presence with us, and that is something we celebrate and we rejoice in and we enjoy, and yet we know we're not, we're not fully in his presence. He is coming again to bring his bride to himself, to, to finish the celebration, to consummate this marriage so that we can begin our life together. And so we fast to show that we do not want to be separate from our bride, groom. Or we fast because that is not true of us. Let me explain what I mean by that. This is one of the reasons fasting is such a helpful spiritual discipline. We either naturally lose our appetite because we desire Christ's presence so much, or we recognize that that is not true of us, because we still long for unholy things. We still wrestle in fallen and broken bodies. And so what we do is we purposefully fast so that we can make a comparison in our hearts. We say, all right, I haven't eaten in a day, two days, three days, whatever, however long it's been. I really want a cheeseburger really bad. With bacon would be even better. And we're able to then compare in our hearts, what do I want more right now? Food or the presence of my groom? And when we're honest with ourselves, we then have the opportunity to pray this kind of prayer. Jesus, I don't want you more than anything right now, but I want to want you more than anything right now. And when we pray those kinds of honest prayers, the Holy Spirit works miraculously in our hearts to change our desires, to give us holy hungers, to long for our groom in the way that we're supposed to. So that's why we fast, is to reorient the priorities of our heart and to say to Jesus, we need your presence more than we need even food to sustain our life. It is a, a beautiful powerful tool that God has given us. But it is very different from why God's people fasted in the Old Testament. We don't look for Christ's coming. He has come. Instead, we long for when he comes again. We don't hope that Jesus will rescue us from our sin. We celebrate that he has already rescued us from our sin, and we long for the fullness of that relationship. And we, in doing so, we train our hearts to long for Jesus above all other longings. And so Jesus, helping 
the people to understand the difference between Old Testament fasting, Old Covenant fasting, and New Covenant fasting. He then takes that opportunity to give a bigger picture understanding of why the New Covenant is important and why we should rejoice in it and how it's different. And so we're going to wrap up with these last two verses. I promise we're rounding third. We're headed home. We could have taken this in two sermons, but we can't preach Mark for the rest of our lives. So we got to knock this out, okay? Stay with me. Jesus wraps us up by giving us two metaphors that are teaching the same truth. Verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. So this is a common sense. you got old clothes. They've been washed. They've been worn. They shrink. If they get a hole and you put a brand new piece of fabric on there, what's going to happen when that fabric begins to shrink? It's not going to cover the hole anymore. It's going to tear away. It's going to be worse than when you first began. Second metaphor, different picture, same idea. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So new wine is essentially grape juice. It hasn't fermented yet. In the fermenting process, it releases gases. So you have to put it into new wineskins that can stretch as the wine ferments. So what would happen if you put new wine into old wineskins? As it fermented, it would try to stretch, but they've already been stretched. They can't stretch any further, and they will burst, ruining both the wine and the wineskins. So in both of these pictures, Jesus is teaching the same truth. He's saying, you have the wrong idea of why I'm here. And I see this because you're asking me about fasting. I'm not here to give you a couple new tips or tricks on how to fast better. I'm not here to help you to follow the old covenant more faithfully. I'm here to fulfill the old covenant and to bring something entirely new. I'm not here to patch up an old system or to top off your spiritual gas tank. I'm here to begin a new work. This is the next step in God's plan of rescuing people. So you're asking the wrong questions. Instead, look to me as the initiator, the guarantor of a new covenant where God's law will not be written on stone, but it'll be written in your hearts instead. And so we could summarize this by saying it in this way. Christ did not come for addition or alteration. Christ came to give emancipation. All right, that finishes out all my rhyming, okay? So addition, Jesus didn't come to top off the wine, to put a little bit more in the old system. Alteration, he didn't come to patch up an old system and to to keep the wheels on the bus, so to speak. No, he came for something entirely different, to begin the next step in God's plan of saving us, to emancipate us, to free us from, first, slavery to sin. Without Christ's power, we do the very thing we hate. We have no ability to resist unholy things, but Jesus frees us from that slavery to sin, and he frees us from guardianship to the law. Paul tells us in Galatians 3, that picture of the slave who's in charge of the son. Even though the son is a son, as long as he's under the the authority of the slave, he's no better than a slave, is what Paul says. But the time of fullness has come. The heir has come to age, and now he is freed from that guardian. And so we have been freed from the Old Testament law. And we rejoice in this emancipation. We rejoice in these steps that God has taken throughout human history to rescue us. They were not arbitrary. They were not unnecessary. He is not confused or coming up with a plan B. He has taken all the steps that he needed to take in order to rescue you. You. That means he gave a law code to an ancient people 4,000 years ago in one step of the plan to rescue you. He's been working towards your salvation now for thousands of years. 
been working that plan since before the foundations of the earth, actually, is what the Bible tells us. Because he loves you. He wants you to be saved. And this happens when we place our faith in the lamb who was slain to establish the new covenant. When we look to the blood of Jesus to pay the punishment for our sins. And when we do that, then we long for him to come and to complete the plan of God's salvation. But until then, we rejoice and we celebrate in what God has done over many thousands of years for us. But also we long for the fullness of Christ's presence. We long for the fullness and the completion of God's plan. It is wrong to wait forever. That's not the purpose of an engagement. Instead, there should come a day when the waiting ends and the celebration begins. Let me promise you this. Though we've been waiting for Christ to return for thousands of years now, we will not wait forever. It is certain that Christ will return because God has promised it. Will you be ready? Because when Christ returns, his bride, the church, those who are saved, it will be a time of celebration. But for those who have not followed Jesus as Lord, it will be a time of punishment, of judgment. So are you ready for him to return? The Bible tells us he'll come like a thief in the night. We won't know the day or the hour. Will you be ready? I'm going to pray for us and we're going to have a time of response, which means it's time to move how the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. It is not dramatic to say that Christ could return before this song ends. Will you be ready? If you're not, come and speak with me in the front. I'll show you from God's word how he can be your Lord and how you can be one member of his bride. So that when he returns, it is a time of celebration for you rather than judgment. Father, we're so thankful for your perfect and holy word. We're so thankful for how you encourage us. You challenge us. You lift us up. You point us towards your son. In this time of response, Lord, we ask that you would help us to be the kind of worshipers that you seek. Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Giving you the glory that you alone deserve. Lord, we ask in this time of response that you would build your kingdom. As more people are added to your kingdom. We ask that you give the people in this room the courage they need to be obedient to whatever the Holy Spirit calls them to in this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.